Is lecithin good for you? Is incredibly good for the gut, but if you are looking for lecithin, then just eat some eggs. <laughs> and who doesn't like eggs with their steak? Well, I do like eggs, but unfortunately, I, I react to eggs, so I, I can't even have eggs. But that's all right. There's still plenty of choice on the carnivore diet. I say I can still have beef, lamb, and fish. There's loads of different varieties of of animals. Even with beef and lamb, people think that's very boring and restricted. But actually, there's lots of different types of cows and lots of different types of lamb. There's there's hundreds, so you can get lots of different flavors by eating different different red meats. So, yeah, and the beauty is that anything grass-fed in terms of beef and lamb are going, they go in to confer a massive benefit in regards to when we look at all the foods that exist on the planet beef is the only one or anything grass-fed beef and lamb are the only ones that have been shown not to cause any reaction uh, even within sort of like the carnivore community some people may suffer um, intestinal permeability or other issues maybe from eggs some from seafood the casein in milk and cheese, uh, even chicken and bacon and pork. Um, now, I've noticed a little bit of this myself. So as as many of you know, I gravitated into this uh, beginning low carb. Then I, beco- I became d- dirty keto, then sort of a clean keto, then um, gravitated into strict and then carnivore. And then carnivore itself has all of these subsections. But regardless of where you are on that journey, gravitating down that path is going to confer a benefit compared to eating the toxic foods that exist in society. And we know processed foods are no good for us, but the foods that, we are, that we're told are good for us, things like the grains uh, and the vegetable oils. Um, and Stephen and I were, were chatting yesterday, as it happens, about vegetable oils, and I'll circle back to that now. But it's any of these changes in regards to removing grains and vegetable oils, reducing carbohydrate, um, not the carbohydrate is the enemy, but it, we don't. It's not essential, and we can make any that we need. But it's the overconsumption of that, and the seed oils are going to confer way more damage than than um, than the carbohydrate itself. But it's um, just by being dirty keto, you're, you're going to see a benefit. But what I've noticed is during my my transition, I became carnivore pretty much four years ago, and I've become a little bit more strict year on year. Um, but what I find now is that even things like chicken will cause issues for me, whereas they weren't before. And it's not because I've, it's not because my body has become resilient to them. It's because my body now has the ability to tell me or give me this heightened sense, um, basically, that something isn't serving me. Um, and we see this with people who suffer with maybe a gluten intolerance. Now we this this whole thing with celiac disease and, and gluten intolerance, it, it's it's almost a fallacy because we all we all suffer with with gluten intolerance or lectin intolerance and this there's something called non celiac gluten sensitivity. It's a spectrum, and we're all on this spectrum. So if you were t- if you were to be tested for celiac disease, for example, it may show negative, but it doesn't mean that these lectins don't cause the damage. Um, but when we restrict these foods that contain lectins in the form of wheat, germ, gluten, and we restrict the bread, pastas, rice, and then we reintroduce them, they suddenly cause lots of issues that we didn't notice before. But it doesn't mean that those problems weren't there. Those issues were always there. It's just our ability to recognize them has now become massively enhanced in the same way that alcohol does with an alcoholic. So the, the first time you drink a glass of wine, you know, it, it'll give you a light head and tingles. You might become a little bit tipsy. Two or three glasses of wine and you may be drunk. The more you drink, the less effect that has on you. It doesn't mean that that alcohol isn't causing damage. It's just your ability to recognize it becomes less and less. And it's the same with the foods that we eat. So gluten being one of them or, you know, lectins, wheat, germ, gluten, phytohemoglutinin, all of these things. But the more strict you become, the more that the body realizes that these other foods and not conferring a benefit, and, and they are causing harm. So it's it's very much a case of um, where where you are on your journey and where, where you want to reside. And that's why in regards to like the lack of thin sort of thing, it's, I would say that there may be a benefit with a product that does contain sunflower lack of thin. Um, ideally, I wouldn't consume it unless it was from an egg source, but I wouldn't be put off by that. But as you gravitate further down, maybe your reaction to that may be enhanced uh, and therefore 
they may be it may be pertinent to remove that completely and think of of just becoming a little bit more strict. But I can see a few things popped up in um in the chat there. Yeah, that's why I put my hand up just I to let see it. That's, sorry. <laughs> that's all right. Well, I'm trying to be a good helper here. So I don't know how to pronounce this. I'm assuming it's just Asa, but um anyway, or Asa. Can you talk about MCT powder before and during weight training to support to support energy low energy level is my biggest concern when i compare to having some carbs before training okay fantastic question so my first my first response to, to that would be that there is a transition phase in becoming ketogenic and carnivore you are going to feel tired and lethargic look this is mostly to do with um electrolyte issues lack of sodium potassium in particular so ele- address the electrolytes would be first and foremost mct will work within the body whether you were ketogenic carnivore or whether you were on carbohydrate the beauty with mct in particular c8 which is the one that we produce it's the world's highest purity this is sent straight to the liver through the hepatic portal vein and it's instantly converted into ketones into beta hydroxybutyrate the master ketone body now a little bit technical but when you begin a journey a ketogenic journey the body is inefficient it wastes ketones in the form of acetoacetate and acetone so these are the ketones that we breathe out and the, the ketones that we pee out so these are the ketones that we see on the breath monitor and on the urine strips but as we maintain this lifestyle if you were to test a urine strip or a breath monitor, you may show a negative reading. And this happened to me when I began my journey and I thought that I was doing something wrong. Yet I would be an incredibly strict, but it wasn't that I was doing something wrong. It's, it's because I was doing everything right. My body had now adapted and now was utilizing ketones as beta hydroxybutyrate and it wasn't wasting them as acetone and acetoacetate. And it's when you produce this beta hydroxybutyrate that the, the energy levels go through the roof, the mental clarity becomes crystal clear and all of these real big benefits start to occur. The benefits happen as soon as you start, but the longer you live the, li- the lifestyle, the, the more, it's almost a lifestyle that never stops giving. In order to get to that point, there is an adaptation period. But the MCT uh, and things like exogenous ketones, they signal the body to ramp up the specific pathways that allow us to utilize the BHB. So they tell the body to make BHB instead of, and utilize BHB instead of wasting things like acetone and acetoacetate. So this BHB is going to supply energy to the brain, the body, and the heart. Um, So taking it before a workout, With a coffee works very well if you are drinking coffee. Obviously, within the carnivore community, there are many of us who do not drink coffee, but caffeine can confer a benefit in regards to training. It is a known ergogenic aid. Um, And I think if you can cope with coffee, mixing it with, mixing the MCT with the coffee will only further enhance the body's ability to utilize that energy. So taking it, Pre, as a pre-workout, uh, maybe a scoop in, in some coffee would confer a benefit in in in, in regards to exercise. Um, electrolytes again, or salts, and the BHB uh, would also do the same thing. But you are going to see this drop off. You, you, we're coming from this life t- life lifetime of being fueled by sugar, and then we're suddenly removing sugar from the diet, and we automatically and instantly expect the body to make this transition. And it doesn't, it doesn't know what to do. We need to upregulate all of these pathways and these enzymes within the body. And it does take time. So stick with it. Your training will drop off a cliff, but we can heavily negate that by things like MCT electrolytes uh, and, and ketones. Um, and what else was I going to say? And, and if you, if you know, weight training, for example, you can negate the power loss with things like creatine monohydrate. But there's, there's lots of levers to pull. Um, but the most important thing is this adaptation uh, period. But it um, it will come, so stick with it. Definitely. And we see it time and time again, don't we? I mean, it is a big common issue, even people not working out, saying I feel a little bit more tired than I used to. And you've got to remember that protein takes five times as much energy to digest as carbohydrates. So your body's got to adapt to that as well. Also, timing of your nutrients might be helpful. So some people seem to thrive when they work out fasted, which could be 
because they're not digesting. You see, so there's lots of little nuances as well, but that's great. Um, we've got a question from Helen. Um, before I go on to that, I just want to say to everyone in the room, um, we're going to record this, so it'll go in a replay. So if you've got that long answer there and you're whistling down, taking notes, and you think, oh, I wish wish I could watch it again, we will put it up on um, Mighty Networks for other people to see. We may even put snippets onto YouTube So, um, and just say this is from our Mighty Networks. So Helen's asked, just wondered, during the cold winter months, does our body require extra nutrients? Uh, which is an excellent question, by the way. Apart from the vitamin D due to darker days, as I seem to be craving Marmite, I <laughs> just wondered if it's a lack of B vitamins, even though I have liver once a week. Yeah, quite possibly. It's We are, we are designed to, to store fat come in towards the winter period. This is why we consume fruit at the end of summer. And that's what fruit does. The fructose tells the body to store fat. But it's vitamin D is incredibly important. Um, we get that from the sun. But most of us produce the vitamin D from the food that we eat. So it depends on where you come from within the world, you know, from, from an ancestral sort of perspective. Now, most of my vitamin D is synthesized from, from the food that I eat. So I'm obviously native to a, a cloudy climate, you know, coming from Wales, obviously related to the Celts. And I've, I'm not used to seeing the sun. So I, I love the sun, but the sun doesn't love me so much. But it, it is very important. But my vitamin D levels are incredibly high for someone that barely sees the sun. Uh, I'm stuck in a cave pretty much all day working. Um, so I get very little sunlight and that's not healthy but my vitamin D levels are optimal through the food that I eat. So we can hit that through the food that we eat. But I I, I think I think so. I think the body is uh, highly intuitive. It is telling us that we need nutrients. Um, you know, if, if weight loss is the goal, then the cold weather is fantastic for that because this is where we burn more weight than, than anything else is, is the cold weather. Uh, and in fact... I, I think we should probably build cold gyms because you're going to burn more body fat in a cold gym than you are in a warm gym. But it's B vitamins, incredibly important. We're going to get all of these through the foods that we eat, especially the red meat, the liver. Um, we can't get these nutrients from plants. Vitamin D doesn't exist in plants. And B, most B vitamins, particularly pyridoxine and cobalamin, B12, do not exist in plants. So if your body is telling you to eat these foods, then and, and if you like liver knock yourself out. Liver is fantastic if you like it. Um, many can't cope with it, but it, it is a fantastic um, source of nutrients. And if you can't, then just eat more beef and lamb. Yeah, and um, I can see Matthew's got his hands up. Matthew, if it's if it's uh, concurrent to this question, jump in. If not, we've got one more from Jay and then we'll come to you because I like, well, I'm English. I like people to be in a queue. And yeah. So if it's about this, chime in now but if not we'll do jay's question and then yours if that's okay that okay yeah i've just got one thing to add to this but i'll go and uh, do it there that's fine that's fine okay so oh i forgot that what was it <laughs> don't worry i'll come back to it later you carry on <laughs> yeah, sorry sorry um yeah because jay's had a question there uh one thing i experience is very cold hands and feet the info I can find is conflicted, so I just wondered if you had any idea on this. Um, if I can just chime in first, Rich, on that. Yes, it's very conflicted. Now, I've got 15 years of rehab experience, and I've cured people's Raynards, okay, uh, in the room. I've actually had people come in uh, with cold hands and feet, and you can actually uh, pretty much fix it straight away with a bit of manipulation, because a lot of a lot of that can be uh, within the neck in uh, C3, 3, 4, and 5, and you can do a cavitation there, which actually improves the supply of those peripheral nerves. And am amazingly, I get people to stand here and say, my hands are cold, my hands are cold, and it's very boring. That's why I've never videoed it on YouTube, but 20 minutes later, they're going, uh, well, actually, the Raynards is amazing because you can see the white bit actually disappear. So sometimes it's it's a it's actually a mechanical or biomechanical thing, possibly from too much on the phone, you know. So you've got this head forward issue. Um, it could be sort of like a crush injury, those sort of things. So cold hands and feet can be mechanical, but also it can be nutritional. 
because again, cold hands and feet, a very common thing that comes up that's been cured by eating this way. Now I know, you know, Rich is keto and, you know, carnivore. He's more carnivore, but he's also a big fan of keto. I've found, and this is not knocking keto, the more carnivore you are, the the, the, the better this is. The And certainly the longer you've been doing it. Which, which might even mean that once you've done carnivore for a couple of years, maybe, you could go back to keto and still not have the problems with the hands and the feet. And um, I, ju- I just want to add something, and maybe this will bump um, Matthew's memory, uh, about the cold weather. A lot of people say, well, you need zinc, you need vitamin C, and <laughs> that's because you're getting lots of colds. Well, you've got to go to the stem. Well, why are they getting colds? Because their vitamin D is low and vitamin D is massive in the function of the immune system. So I never say it's the co- it's the cold season or the flu season. I say it's the vitamin D deficiency season. Um, and again, as Richard said, most people think of it from sunlight. The reason they're not getting it from food is because they're eating an inappropriate diet. So there's two ways of, of fixing that. So yeah, that's my two penneth. So there you go. Um, Cold hands and feet is your question, uh, Rich. And then maybe Matthew can get in with his question. Yeah, I think you've nailed that. It's just circling back to one of the things you said, you know, about keto carnivore. Carnivore is the creme de la creme. And there are even subsections within the carnivore spaces in regards to how healthy you can be with, you know, just eating beef and lamb being top of the pyramid. But, you know, I support anyone in regards to health eating, whether they are low carb, dirty keto, and all the way, all the way through the spectrum. And, and that's what I do as as a nutritionist and, and as a business. Um, ideally, I'd love everybody to be carnival, but we're we're all on our own journey. So if if you're not on the lion diet and you are consuming certain vegetables, that's fine. You know, we've there's nothing ag- against that. I do think being carnival is considerably better, but it's this this uh, incremental process you know the longer we are traveling on this road um the more changes that we make we see the benefits and then we make another change and another change uh you know up until a few years ago i was still eating lots of vegetables and i believed and i was super healthy i was consuming my spinach and kale smoothie with with uh my turmeric and black pepper and i felt amazing Yet the, these these are not good for you, and I don't know if we've got time maybe to go into that. If any of you've got any questions as to why, um, but they don't confer a benefit, and, and quite the opposite, in fact. But I was still incredibly healthy, but I was healthy because I was making lots of of, of the right things. I was making lot, lots of the right decisions, um, but it, it and that was enough to offset the negative ones. But removing those, so you know, saw a, a further sort of. Um, um, increase in health and well-being but and i've probably gone off of one there but it's coming back to this look it i i suffer in the cold um steve laughing there i i, I suffer in the cold i hate the cold weather i'm single figure body fat you know so i get cold hands and feet the, the hands and feet are the first place to go you know and, and the years it's when you start to lose body fat you're gonna feel the cold a lot more so it could be Everything that Stephen has just said, it could just be that you're losing body fat. You're a lot leaner than you were before. Put some gloves and a couple of layers of socks on. You know, address all the things that Steve's mentioned, but it, it, it could just be that you're losing weight. I suffer terribly with a cold um, because I'm single figure body fat. No, I didn't suffer so much when I was clinically obese, um, but where would I rather be? You know, I'd I'd rather put an extra layer on, you know, in, in, in the winter rather than stocking up with all my fructose and gaining all this uh, this excess body fat and having to, to shift it all again. Uh, and we have central heating. Yes, it's expensive and maybe we don't want to put it on <laughs> at the moment with the price of heating. But it's, um, yeah, I, I think lack of body fat is a big contributing factor that many of us seem to, to, to overlook. Steve, you're still muted. Yes. Uh, yeah, Jay, Jay has put some additional uh, messages in the chat. And he says, uh, oh, she says, I should have been clearer. I don't often fall off the bus, but when I get back to Carnival, day two to day five, my hands and feet freeze. I just wondered if I could solve it. If it does go, but it does go away, thankfully, and then comes back. So I wonder if I was missing nutrients. That's okay. Um, but Jay's happy with our responses. I mean, this, this is one of the things. If you jump back in and out of Carnival and then you go off, uh, 
the bus, as Jay saying, or, you know, fall off the wagon, however you want to look at it, your body doesn't really like that because it's becoming a fat burner and then you start putting sugar in and you do maybe you've taken taken like two steps forward and then you're taking one step back and that's fine as long as you're not um beating yourself up over it because this is a long journey uh right okay matthew okay so just adding to talking about vitamin d I can remember that Anthony Chafee and Paul Mason did an excellent podcast, I think it was about a year ago, on why people should not supplement vitamin D. It is definitely not the same as getting sunlight, but it's it's never even worth taking vitamin D. Best to get it from your food and, yeah, just, just get it naturally. And if you're in a cold climate, it could possibly be something like the nit- nitro- uh, nit- nitric oxide deficiency because I think that's what the sun helps your body produce yeah that's right so yeah is that so actually su- supplementing something like uh citrulline could be more beneficial than what vitamin d could be is that correct spot on citrulline malate so we look at when we look at sunlight and producing vitamin d um and we look at the benefits that that come with this increase in vitamin d it's not actually the vitamin d that is is showing the benefit the vitamin d is a surrogate marker but what the companies have done is they've jumped on this bandwagon. Basically, as you become healthier, vitamin D comes up. It's not because of the vitamin D, it's because of the increase in nitric oxide. UVA rays from the sun. So UVA are the type of rays that we um, are hit by early in the morning and late in the night. So that that's the healthy sort, sort of UV. The UVA rays increase nitric oxide, as Matthew says. Uh, and nitric oxide is a, a vasodilator and something that is known to increase longevity. Citrulline malate, which is an amino acid that you can take in supplement form, which tastes like, like citrus, hence the name. Um, and it's it's a good way to sweeten something if you're looking to, to sweeten something with a powder that's natural but that will also increase nitric oxide and coming back to athletic performance it's a fantastic compound to use before running or cycling anything that you're going to you're going to need lots of oxygen for because it will increase this um uh it, it, it's a vasodilator so it's going to increase the blood flow and, and nutrient uptake um and coming back to vitamin d just circling back to what you just said there if you have Lots of body fat. Supplementing with vitamin D is a complete waste because vitamin is the the fat within the body becomes a sink for the vitamin C. The vitamin uh, sorry, the vitamin D. The vitamin D that we supplement with is 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 absorbed by the fat within the body and it is not used in the way that we want it to. So, vitamin D from food and from the sunlight are the best ways to take them. And I'm not against supplementation of, of vitamin D. Um, I just think it could be wasted when there are lots of better ways to to obtain that vitamin D. Great stuff. Helen has asked a question, a nice simple one. Is white pepper better than black pepper? Um, just so you know, black pepper is from the unripe green berries and white pepper just comes from the same berry. But it's ripe. That's it. And there's, a, you know, the shell was taken off. Uh, I want to put my two pennies in, Rich, because we've only got right. like three or four minutes left. But I just quickly want to say, I'm not a fan of seeds. Full stop. So anything that's a seed. So when you talk about salt and pepper, you're talking about two completely different things. Pepper is a seed of the plant, which is like the baby of the plant, so it's very well protected. And uh, salt is a mineral. So yeah, uh, but I'll let Rich get into it because I'm sure he's going to talk about pepperine. Uh, well, spot, spot on. <laughs> yes, yeah, spot on. So, so seeds within plants are highly defended. They are, um, if, if we think of plants and animals, we are in an evolutionary arms race. Um, the animals eat the plants, but the plants don't want to be eaten. So all plants contain plant toxins, these phytoalexins, chemicals that poison uh, human beings. And these, these are even... You know, broccoli, kale, spinach, all of these things. This is where oxalates and, and all of these other nasties come from. And we can probably go into this a little bit deeper in the, in, uh, at another time in regards to, you know, the detrimental impacts and, and the effect on the endocrine system and and all of these other sort of, sorts of things. But seeds are highly defended. Um, black pepper or pepperine, as uh, Steve alluded to there, it, it's um, that blocks an enzyme within the body called glucuron, glucuronosyltransferase, which is an enzyme which is 
part of phase two detoxification in the liver. So phase two detoxification is when the body is excreting toxins from, from things that are within the body. So all the nasties. The black pepper blocks the body's ability to do this. It blocks glucuronosyl transferase. It blocks our body's ability to take these toxins away. So when we are putting black pepper and white pepper on our food, it is blocking this enzyme's ability to take toxins out. So while it is present, the liver cannot function properly. It cannot perform its job. So if we are consuming things like black pepper with um, uh, spinach, for example, spinach is incredibly high in oxalates. These oxalates are no longer excreted and then are absorbed. And this is what leads to things like kidney stones and arthritic pains, Um even breast cancer, you know, testicular cancer, um, and all sorts of other issues. They contain these little needles called raphides, um, which they are as nasty as they look through through a microscope. Absolutely damaging to human tissues and bone, um, and every part, every organ within the body. That's what black pepper does. Now, coming back to the original question, um, now white pepper. So Matthew just put white pepper is lower in oxygen. So it yes. So when we look when we look at these things, white pepper is going to cause less damage than black, but it, it's 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 like comparing white bread to brown bread. You know, people say that white bread is um, uh, or brown bread they say is healthier, um, and it may be, but on the scale of unhealthiness, you know, this is this could be white bread and brown bread is right up there with it, just fractionally healthier arguably. So when people say brown bread is healthier, it doesn't mean that it's healthy. Healthy. It just means it's healthier um, or less damaging if you want to put that spin on it. And it's the same with things like white pepper. It causes less damage, but it still causes damage. Um, when we look at things like spinach and kale, spinach to me is far more damaging than kale, but kale can still cause damage. When we look at foods that contain lectins, bread, Muesli, pasta, rice, these things, bar white rice, contain these lectins, which cause damage. Then we look at plants. Now, plants also contain lectins in the form of something called phytohemagglutinin. Tomatoes are high in lectins. Bell peppers are high in lectins. Onions are high in lectins. But the, the damage from those lectins is less than the damage from the lectins, the wheat germagglutinin in the grains. But So they're healthier, but they still cause a damage. And this is why... When you begin a ketogenic lifestyle, removing bread and things like that is 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 number one or number two on on the chart, and this is why many will still consume the vegetables and find that they are conferring a benefit while keeping those in. But when they remove them, they move further down that that rabbit hole and, and notice that there are still further improvements in health and well being. Does that make sense? Makes total sense. So we're coming to the end. Thank you everyone for attending. Um, like I say, we'll make a playback of this and that will be out and you'll be able to see it on mighty networks but we'll also probably put a highlights on the youtube as well so uh thank you richard thank you matthew for doing your moderating i think and, steve if uh if it continues to, to build with um the the volume of uh of uh people attending then maybe we'll have to bump it up to three quarters or an hour possibly yep. in a couple of weeks yep. but we can yeah. do that that's okay right lovely so thanks everyone for attending fantastic thank you all Take care, yeah. God, and speak to you soon.